So my name is Rhiannon Armstrong and I'm here because the people in charge of booking this workshop uh, think of me, I think, as an artist who knows what they're doing in the world of digital and online, but also I think as someone who isn't all kind of tech expert and full of circuit boards and soldering irons and web coding handbooks at home. I come from a theatre background, so the experience of the person who will interact with my art is always something I'm thinking about. I usually make art work that people will come across without meaning to, maybe on their way home from the shops or just when they're scrolling around online, that kind of thing. I do have a soldering iron, but I haven't used it on any circuit boards and my coding knowledge is very limited. But since 2015, I have had a performance art practice that incorporates online intervention and what we might call digital or in 2020 remote mediums. So you would think maybe that I was in a great place in 2020 when everything in real life was cancelled and went online. And in a way I was. I've been using video and GIFs in recent work and I could do some more with that. Um, I also turned an audio work from 2019 um, into a radio documentary for Radio 3. But I am also struggling because although I have made online work, it has always been tied in very clearly to a real life situation or encounter. And whatever my work, wherever, whatever my work has been with online or otherwise, it's always in response to what's happening in our lives. Artists are experts at creating relevant and moving works in whatever medium they choose, but everything about life and what it is has changed so rapidly and keeps changing. And it can be hard to think straight, much less figure out how you're gonna make a relevant artwork in a new digital medium. <laughs> um, so uh, a sort of quick plug in a way, but also by way of introducing the way I'm thinking about today. And um, the best thing I did with my time this year by far was to spend a day a week um, for a few months on a Skype call with another artist, Tim Spooner. We played together with the Skype call as a medium and with the microscope cameras that we both happen to have at home. And we have made a work. It's called the Microscope Sessions, and you can come to it on the 15th of January at 1 p.m. as part of the South Bank Centre's Unlimited Festival. It'll be on Zoom, like everything else is. Um, but it's not what we set out to do. We didn't set out to make a, a work for Zoom or Skype or whatever. Um, we just agreed to spend time together and to do whatever we could with our time that would help us both feel cared for and feel interested and feel good if possible. So my plan for today is to talk through my approach to my work. So how I decided to do what, how I decide what it is that needs to be said and what medium to say it in. I'm gonna use as an example, two projects that I've made that do use digital or remotely accessible formats. Um, the first one is the first project that went digital and the second one is one that started with the idea of an online space. I really think that for the most part the tool isn't the issue. You spend enough time with something and you can figure out how to work it. The issue for artists is how to say something with that tool or in that context and that takes a bit of time and time without pressure to deliver. So if there's anything I hope you can take away from today, then it's perhaps the permission to grab one of these tools, whichever one is most interesting to you, and to spend some time playing with it, thinking about life, and then to see what comes. So the things I have here, we're not gonna do something with all of them. So the first piece I'm gonna talk about is um, called the International Archive of Things Left Unsaid. And um, it is the first piece that I made sort of for an online space, but it didn't start out that way. So um, it started as a one-to-one -one performance. And these are some photos of that one-to-one -one performance. 
and I I think I made it first for um, an event that was called There's Something I've Been Meaning to Tell You and I collected uh, anonymous things that people people wrote that wrote things down anonymously answering the question think of a time when you wanted to say something to someone um, and you knew what you wanted to say but for whatever reason you didn't and then just write down the words that were not said on that occasion so with that a sort of small collection of about 25 of those as my starting point I learned them as scripts and then did these one-to-one -one, um, performances which are very short where I just recited one of those testimonies they have no context they're just the words that didn't come out of the mouth of someone who wanted to say it at the time um, as I started um, doing that performance I was giving people cards to write feedback on and what was often coming to me was not like oh, I thought this was really good, or I didn't like this or anything, that kind of feedback, but actually people were writing their own answers to that question. Um, people who had come to listen to someone else's testimony had just felt, were sort of, I picked up, they were feeling the urge to kind of write their own and put it back into this collection. So I started making that a formal part of the work. Um, so this is an, uh, a shot of, where the performance took place in a gallery in Amsterdam and I the background is the kind of performance site so people could walk around um, and they would see the one-to-one -one performance happening but they wouldn't be able to get near it and um, and then this area with a ballot box that's locked and some chairs is where people could write their own um, and the hazard tape, I just want to mention as well, is there's something around this, like the danger of emotions, right? Because why didn't people say these things? Is it fear of consequences of not being heard? Anyway, I've just, I haven't looked at that image for a while, so it's fun to remember it. So I formally incorporated that into the work and people kept telling me um, that, oh, you should put it online. There's various work online things and um, the Guardian had this long running series where people would write confessions on a postcard and you could you could um, scroll through them but I always resisted that a bit until there was an opportunity in 2015 um, for a digital art commission from the space and it was the space um, is first perform like commission of a performance in a digital medium they're most known now I think for a bit more like increasing the reach of theater works and um putting theater into kind of tv or broad like sort of broadcasting of maybe what we might consider more traditional mediums but at this time we were looking at how do you make a performance an online thing not like how do you broadcast a performance so um I got this commission um and I think the most important thing I learned about it was in the process of we made it into a website so it was a website that was live for five years four years um, and I took what I'd learned from the other ways I'd presented the work that people wanted to listen but they also wanted to write something so we built in this cyclic possibility um, but I also had to question in this process because because it could have been anything um, it could have been it was in the end it's an a, it it's an it was an interactive site where you scrolled through this index um, where you could choose which one you wanted to listen to you would only be allowed to listen to one every two days and it was a listening and not a video um but the whole process making process that wasn't all that was what we came to so it wasn't always clear we tried video we tried all these things and the process of deciding how could this work exist as an online piece and still be itself, like be kind of have the integrity of the original intention. 
was really interesting because I had to learn how to explain what was important about it. So there was the ways that I had done it and the decisions I had made. But in talking to a, a coder who doesn't really care or understand about performance art, I had to really come to understand quite quickly what is it that is important about this. And what I decided was the most important thing was that this was needed to be a place where people would really take in these testimonies. They would really listen to them. So every once I realized that was what was important, that, that people who had written down their things that they had left unsaid that had been sort of weighing on them, that I wanted to take those and I wanted everything that would happen around them to be, to feel like those things were being really cared for. Um, so that's why you could only listen to one. Um, and then the whole um, design of the site was such that it was designed to kind of slow, slow down your experience of online, of being online. Um, so these two images, can you see my pointer when I'm pointing? Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. So these two images are, are GIFs that we made and disseminated as a, online as a kind of teaser for the work. Um, but also they, they show how the public index um, functioned so that I made these sort of I called them like forward long poems that represented in some way the sentiment in the testimony behind it and the words would fade in and out um, and the the sort of atmosphere of that meant that it was kind of slowing people down and then every time you clicked on anything it took half a second to fade into the next thing which was just enough time to feel like it was slowing people down um, but not so much time that you felt like it was broken. So yeah, so that was my sort of uh, process of turning into a digital commission. But then because the digital commission was in part commissioned by a theater, by a Battersea Arts Center, they wanted to tour it around the country. So how do you tour a website <laughs> um, that's just always there? Um, and that's when I made this quilt. <laughs> um, so the kind of go-to thing at the time for any sort of digital work being presented in a gallery or in a theater or you know wherever was was that you would have a monitor, you would have a computer, and and people could sit at it and visit the website there, and that was how you were gonna kind of share it. That felt um, boring to me <laughs> for this work. And also like it didn't carry on this commitment to care and listening and making sure that people were gonna really pay attention. Um, I we made the site work on computers and on um, smartphones and I was really interested in and I still am really interested in the relationship with a with a smartphone between a person and their smartphone as a really really intimate relationship and an intimate space it's got so much if someone looks at you know what what we've been visited like search histories our messages even just the way we arrange our apps whose photos we have and as wallpapers it's such an intimate thing um and so much we experience so much through it. Like I've had really devastating rejection emails that I've read, you know, when I'm in bed at night with holding this. Um, I've had really excellent good news, you know, everything, every kind of emotion has passed between me and this screen. Um, so I wanted something that would be, that would enable that kind of um, way of experiencing it that could tour. Um, and the quilt was also a way of, um, of putting in some of this intimacy and touch. So we have our relationships with our phones, which we touch all the time. And then I embroidered sections of the testimonies, um, copying the original handwriting into the quilt, which also has this kind of tactile and intimate quality. And I also wanted with the quilt to kind of connect in some way to 
the time and effort and care that it takes to make a website <laughs> because actually making a website from scratch where you decide all these things like how how many milliseconds are you going to leave between a click and the movement or you know all that kind of stuff it re it requires a huge amount of care and time and effort and that's the same for um patchwork quilting and embroidery and um, so i just wanted something that would have that relationship in from the real world and the digital world um, as a way of touring it so it has toured um to loads of different contexts um, in, with this quilt um, but now it is over the website um kind of just was became too expensive to keep up to date sort of technically um, and i had to close it down and the quilt is hanging in my house But in January, some of the testimonies from the archive, of which there are about 500, I think, um, will be released as videos on Instagram, published by Welcome Collection. And um, so you can follow the hashtag hold behold beheld because it's part of a, a bigger project. Um, or follow my Instagram. <laughs> Um, but that's kind of another way where like this material, this work I've built up, my understanding of what, what I think is important about it. And I now have a kind of familiarity and flexibility with different places it can go to um, that I wouldn't have ever thought of when I first just thought I'm gonna do this one-to-one -one performance. So, that's my first project um, and the other one I'm going to talk about is the slow gift movement. So the slow gift movement is like sort of the latest big online project and it is the first one that really evolved first as an idea about our online world and that I wanted to do as an intervention in the online world. And in the end, as part of exploring that um, and trying to communicate this idea, I ended up making a one-to-one -one encounter that is now a very important part of this project. Um, because I thought that's, it, that would do what I wanted best for an audience. So the slow gift movement was a response to current gift culture with its anxiety inducing pace and constant flashing. So this um, gift culture, not, it, on, it not only literally hurts my me because <laughs> uh, I have chronic migraine, like all this flashing, repeating gifts and um, that people started using in, in messages all the time. Um, a, a sort of about yeah about four years ago um, I think it also though contributes to an overall atmosphere that care, kills care and collective responsibility so my thinking was what if we chose to highlight create and put up on our walls like our virtual walls a different kind of gift culture one with an access and well-being agenda what if we created a slow gift movement what would that be like so the slow gift movement officially launched on the 15th of August 2019 um, with this accredited Giphy channel and an online campaign. I had just done a bit of research and development over a couple of months um, and I'd made a few different types of collections of, of what I considered to be slow gifts and developed a sense of a kind of brief for what a slow gift could be. And the, the sort of subsection of those slow gifts um, that I want to talk about is the poems, which you can see here. Um, and it's called Co Poems Made From Words Found in the Bin. So I started making, writing poems around these pieces of shredded paper. Um, so a single strip of shredded paper and writing a poem around it and then animating the uh, as a gif um, the moving the piece of paper to and fro like in a metronome kind of tick-tock motion and those and then um so 
I, once I'd made that as part of my exploration of what could a slow GIF be, I'm a performance artist and I happen to be working in a digital realm. My work almost always involves a public interaction and I'm always thinking, how can I get someone to be part of this? Um, so I developed um, this poems made from words found in the bin kind of work connected to the slow gift movement where I travel to libraries and other public spaces with a sort of a one-to-one -one performance or just encounter it's like a yeah a one-to-one -one encounter um, which builds up the poem collection um, so the, inv the invitation is simple so you write a poem with a piece of shredded paper found in the bin as your stimulus we're taking care over something that has been destroyed and discarded, and we're gonna try and make it into something beautiful and true. Then I animate it using a smartphone and a free app, and I upload it to this accredited Giphy channel and it becomes part of the Slow GIF movement collection, which then in turn makes it accessible on Giphy keyboards on, on on people's smartphone apps. So it's ready for you to access and disseminate online as a kind of citizen of the slow GIF movement. So in the workspace um, that I offer people, you're accompanied by a piece of handmade lace or embroidery that they're sold in charity shops for almost nothing, like nobody wants them. Um, but someone once took a lot of time and care over crafting it. And I like the idea that 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 keeps you company while you're taking time and care over your poem. And um, people have commented that the process of writing the poem feels like a mindful action, which is comparable to that of sewing or embroidery. Um, and also that the act of reading the poem as a gif online produces a similar kind of mindful focus. So, once your poem has been turned into a GIF, um, it also has the chance of being shown on a big screen um, locally or across the country because the piece, the, co the collection continues to grow and I take it to different places. So this um, is some, are some images from Portsmouth last summer, like 20, summer 2019 as part of Aspects's um, exchange program and um, and I really I found that really powerful um, and I I think there's a politics to using the platform that's there because I'm an artist to spread whatever message somebody else has decided is important to spread um, and a, a, I can't click I can't click this to make it go but um this is a poem that was written um, by a former university lecturer who's originally from Algeria and living in Portsmouth. And she wrote it, she talked to me about it, she wrote it as an anti-racist poem. And she wrote that when she found out that the poems might be shown to a big audience. And it has been shown in Portsmouth as she intended. And also then this is a picture of it on a big um, advertising billboard in Brighton. And that's a whole other thing. I can't wait to do um, more work with this and taking over advertising space. I don't know how I get to do that, but that's where I wanted to go next. Um, so there's something about um, touring this poems thing and opening up the slow GIF creation process to people to participate in um, that's doing a lot of the things I wanted to do when I first conceived of the idea. And one of the things is demystifying the idea of digital art. So showing people that anyone can make it with really simple tech, like a smartphone and just like moving your piece of paper with your finger. And um, making the connection between public space online and the built environment and bringing up issues of care and responsibility in those spaces. And um, making connections between the physical, the emotional and the digital. And then it also is allowing me to use the platforms I have access to in service of other people's creative expression. So that's the projects I wanted to talk about. Um, they're the ones I put on my like snazzy digital CV. 
but I think it's important to note that both of them really came from noticing something or wanting to investigate or shine a light on something in real life that I thought I wanted to look at and um, and it's really that and then wanting to to create an experience for an audience that then guides me and then whatever me whatever medium you know is around that might help that I'm sort of ready to to try and get to know like any new medium for an artist I think the main thing I always need and feel like I never have enough time with is like is time to play around and time to think around about what my art is really trying to do for people and then how I might do that with this kind of tool or medium.